It's 1993 and a new band from Manchester are travelling across the North Sea to play their first gig abroad. Riding high on a mix of youthful arrogance, booze and drugs, their journey turned chaotic and erupted into a riot. And in the end, they were sent back home in disgrace. What should have been the end, a bitter bust up between brothers, is instead just the beginning. Because this isn't just any band. These were Liam and Noel Gallagher and this was Oasis. So 30 years later, we're rewinding the tape right back to the start to revisit the story of an album that almost definitely maybe didn't happen. It's 1991 and the Manchester scene is in full swing. Sporting a healthy blend of old rock and acid house and Mancunians are obsessed with the newly established rave culture. Amongst all of this, there's Rain, a band that's not quite fitting in. They're trying to be a guitar band in a city obsessed with synths and drum machines. Paul Gwigsey McGuigan, Tony McCarroll, and Paul Bonehead Arthurs are on the hunt for a place on Frontman when they invite their friends to audition for the band. Real name William John Paul Gallagher, Liam for short, blew the socks off the other three and agreed to join the band on one condition. They needed a new name. Liam and his older brother Noel had an Inspiral Carpets poster hanging on their bedroom wall as kids. The poster was promoting a gig at the Oasis Leisure Centre in Swindon. Yes, Oasis are named after a venue in fucking Swindon. They played their first gig in August 1991, supporting the band Sweet Jesus at the now legendary Boardwalk Club, a venue synonymous with Manchester's music scene, which also acted as ground zero for them. The club was known for hosting iconic bands like the Happy Mondays, the Charlatans, James, and also work on trailblazers like the Stone Roses, Hole, Sonic Youth, Verve, and even Rage Against the Machine. This would go on to be a pivotal moment for the band, even if Liam wasn't particularly comfortable with the performance. I mean, I'll tell you what, it was it was horrible because the only people that were there was your mates, really, you know what I mean? So it's like they're just like that going, what the fuck are these all? Who the thing, who, what are you doing? Come on, let's go to the pub. Let's stop all this guitar music and let's go to the pub or go and watch the match or something, you know what I mean? I think, you know, once you've done the hardest gig ever, you know what I mean? The rest of them are pretty easy then, aren't they? Shortly after their first gig, Liam's older brother Noel, who at the time was a roadie for Inspiral Carpets, joined Oasis on the understanding that he would be their sole songwriter. He had loads of stuff written when we walked in. We were a band making a racket with four tunes and all of a sudden there was loads of ideas. They went on to record their live demonstration tape in the basement of the boardwalk which would feature early versions of tracks including Columbia, Bring You On Down, Married With Children and none other than Rock and Roll Star. It's estimated that about 10 copies of this tape exist, with a J-card insert of a spiralling Union Jack. One of these 10 tapes sold in 2016 for £6,000. If I'm honest with you, I thought it would be a lot more. In 1993, they were sharing a rehearsal space with an all-girl band Sister Lover, who had invited them to support them at King Tut's in Glasgow. Scraping together enough cash to hire a van, they embarked on a six-hour journey up the M6. We get there really early. And we said, we're Oasis from Manchester, we're going to play tonight. And he goes, never heard of you. I'm like, ah, clever boy. And the guy said, there's no band down here. He said, yeah, yeah, it's all right with Debbie. And he's like, no, 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 no fucking way. So we just informed him that it was like sweaty of us. And there was only two of him. So he said, well, if you don't let us play, the odds are uh, stacked uh, amazingly in our favour. Fortunately, they managed to strike an agreement because, as luck would have it, creation label head Alan McGee was in the audience. He was so impressed with Oasis after their first set, he went up to the band and offered them a record deal on the spot. Hey, let's play for 20 minutes. We've done four songs. When we came off stage, unbeknown to us, Alan McGee was just stood there with his hand out and he went, oh, hey, man, have you guys got a record deal? So we said, no. He says, you just want one? She said, hey, where have you been? Creation? She said, I suppose so. <laughs> Three months later, he signed them for a six album record deal. Later that same year, they put out their first single, Columbia, as a teaser for journos and radio shows, and the hype train officially left the station. As their popularity began to brew, talks of an album were an all-time high. With Alan in desperate need for funds of a dying record label and Liam hungry for stardom, they booked a session at the Mono Valley studio to record their debut. Mono Valley became a bit of a legendary space for British rock and roll during the noise and 90s, calling itself home for albums like Everything Must Go by the Manic Street Preachers, Black Holes and Revelations by Muse, Employment by Kaiser Chiefs, let alone nearly the entire catalogue by Stereophonics. Noel had called in a favour to get Dave back 
Batchelor to act as the producer for the record, someone he met during his time touring with Spiral Carpets. For whatever reason, it wasn't landing. In Mono Valley, I think they found it a bit weird because there was separate areas. The way the producer wanted to do it was say, like, the drums go in that room or behind that screen, which I think weirded him out a little bit. There was no live music going on. It was all, you know, it'd be drums, then bass, then guitar, and, it, and it was, it just, it wasn't what anybody was used to. Sessions in the studio were costing upwards of £800 a day. That's nearly 2000 by today's standards. The band left the initial studio session disappointed. So while trying to work out how to patch the rest of the album together, Creation had set up a gig in Amsterdam to support the Verve. This would go on to be Liam's first time outside of the country, and he was mad for it. Hyped up, he decides to spend all of their fuel money on drugs around Manchester picking up drugs and before departing on the ferry they'd taken them all. The accounts all get a bit suspicious from here. They were sat in the bar wanting to celebrate the band's first time overseas and Liam's time first out of the country. They didn't have money at this point so with no way to celebrate it it sounds like Liam and Gwigsy decided to remedy the situation by going to duty free and stealing bottles of champagne. It very quickly spiralled out of control after Bonehead and Gwigsy were accused of using fake 50 pound notes. Liam claimed that Gwigzy had been made redundant by BT and paid him 50 grand in cash, in 50 pound notes, in a briefcase. In classic Liam fashion, a full on bar brawl broke out. Then as a fight broke out, and all I remember was it was a bit Benny Hill. Yeah, it was fucking mayhem, man. I loved it. Suffice to say, the incident ended with all members, bar Noel, who was asleep in his room and totally unaware of everything, getting arrested and eventually deployed back to England. So after failing to successfully record their debut album and catastrophically fucking up their first international gig, they returned to the UK and their manager, Marcus Russell, was not happy. He saw the whole thing as a squandered opportunity to get in front of big wig execs across the world. Alan McGee, however, he saw that there was a bit of a potential here and could use it as a selling point for a new unhinged band on the rise. After all of this chaos, the band still weren't happy with the sound of their first record, so that they decided to return to the studio, this time the Sawmill Studio in Cornwall. Their biggest challenge was trying to capture the energy of their live performances, so they decided to call in the help of their sound engineer on tour, Mark Coyle. I'd be interested to know why they took that risk of putting me in charge of that. No track record whatsoever. The thinking is, who does the live sound? Mark does. So let's go do it live. Thank God for that, you know, because we all knew that Coyley understood it. He got us. He always made a sound how it should sound. So while they were deep into their second stab at recording the album, they released their first single, Super Sonic. Oh, The artwork for the single was taken from their first attempt at recording in Mono Valley, and it debuted at number 31 in the British charts. Prince is the most beautiful girl in the world was number one that week. Despite the success of Supersonic, back in the studio, things still weren't working. There was just something missing. Coyle was an engineer, not a producer. So while it sounded great, it still needed someone to help put the whole picture together. So in a bit of a scramble, Creation Records calls up Owen Morris to mix the record, who pulls it off in Johnny Marr's studio in Manchester over a bank holiday weekend in May 1994. Marcus got me in, because I don't think he knew anybody else. So I was very lucky to be in the right place. No one was like, that sounds great, that'll do. And they let me do exactly what I wanted. And I'm thinking, well, what has he done? You know, I don't get it. He did one mix and it was just outrageous. With their debut album now finally finished, they put out their second single, the now live favorite, Shaker Maker. It's a track that was named after a toy from the 1970s and debuted at number 11, earning themselves an opportunity to perform on top of the pops the following week. Later that month, they were booked to play the enemy stage at 1994's Glastonbury Festival of Contemporary Arts, sharing the stage with other future Britpop heavyweights in Spiral Carpets, Blur, Pulp, and Radiohead. But this just wasn't any gig. It was Glastonbury, and for the first time ever, it was being broadcast on national TV by Channel 4. If you go into the archives to watch this, you'll see this old performance of Live Forever. But it was June, and Live Forever didn't come out till August. So they're playing this track to crowds hearing it for the first time. No one knew what they were witnessing. Fast 
fast forward a couple of months and Live Forever drops and the British public lose their mind. It was the tune, as I remember, that changed everything. Live Forever is just something that's completely different. I'd heard it on the radio. That was the, the time when the switch flipped. And I thought, my God, this is a great song. Noel's arrangements and structures are fucking pop-tastic. You know, it's fucking like ABBA or something. You know, he's a Beatles fanatic, isn't he? So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Oasis. We're gonna live forever. Live Forever catapulted into the top 10. It wasn't just a hit, it became an anthem, and it solidified Oasis as a fan favorite for all of the British public. By this point, Creation Records were in two million pounds worth of debt, and they only had 60K to promote the album. So rather than put spots in magazines like Q or NME, like every other traditional record label would, they decided to put it in football magazines and match programs. His suspicions that Oasis would appeal to these non-traditional audiences was proven when dance music magazine Mix Mag gave the album five stars. It's one of many tactics that New Labour would end up using to win the general election in 1998, which saw Tony Blair become the PM. But this, as well as Creation, and Oasis's input is a story for another day. Definitely Maybe was released in August 1994. It sold 100,000 copies in the first four days and debuted at number one in the UK albums chart, outselling the number two record the three tenors in concert in 1994 by 50%. <laughs> Music outlets like The Enemy and Q Magazine would score the album 9 out of 10 and 4 out of 5 stars. Keith Cameron from The Enemy described Noel Gallagher as a pop craftsman in the classic tradition and a master of his trade, noting that they're more than just hype. To date, it's gone down in history as one of the most explosive debut records in England, selling over 8.5 million copies worldwide. Their story continues to be one of legend. The following year, they followed up Definitely Maybe with the release of their monumental sophomore record, What's the Story, Morning Glory. They went on to headline Glastonbury, going from fourth down on the second stage all the way to the top of the pyramid stage in just 12 months. And by 1996, they'd sold over 250,000 tickets for their now legendary Nebworth gig. They went on to cause trouble all over the world, releasing seven studio albums before falling out and not quitting the band in August 2009. But that is just a story for another day. I hope you enjoyed this vid. It's taken me a long time to put it together and it's it's been since July that I've done a proper video, so I'm really sorry for everyone that's been waiting. But hopefully, the production quality of this one makes up for it. If you like more like this, hit subscribe, let me know who you want me to cover next, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.